you, Lord. Thank you, Isaac. Ushering in the presence, that was huge. Just such a, uh, just really setting the atmosphere. Yeah, he was just like doing what he does. Lord, we thank you for this morning. And uh, thank you, Lord. Mm. That's like a pre-download. I could see, you know, you get close to the rabbi and, and you just, you can't help but give you the download. So he's kind of just doing what he does. Isaac was doing what he did. And now we're just getting prepared to, uh, to worship God. So we're really in his presence already. He goes before us, the word tells us. And he lags behind us, that he's above us, below us, to the right and left of us. That he hems us in for our own protection, that God is everywhere, all the time, always on point, just waiting for us to tap into his omnipotence, his, his all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing spirit, Holy Spirit, moving and breathing. Lord, you just give us every opportunity. There's no place where we can go, Lord God. As David said, if I go down to Shoal, Lord God, you're there. If I ascend to the highest heavens, you're there. There's no place we can go, Lord God, where you aren't there waiting on us. So even this morning, we just sense, Lord, you wait on us here. You wait on us here to come into your presence in spite of what we've done to prepare, Lord God, there is no preparation for the omnipotent God. There is no way that we can possibly be ready for what you are wanting to give to us, to impart to us as we worship you. Lord God, your heart is made glad. I have no idea what that means. That when we incline ourselves towards you, incline our ear, incline our eye, incline our hearts towards you, that we get more of you. That we get more of you. That there's an endless amount of your love, your joy, your peace, your goodness, your kindness, your gentleness, your self-control, your love, your faith. There's no end to it. That we can dive into the rivers and the oceans of love that emanate from your throne yes. for healing our broken hearts, our broken lives, our fractured thoughts. So Lord, come now. Come Holy Spirit into this place. Let there be a holy habitation in this place. Let all those who walk in, all those who come into this place, to hear your word. Let them be changed. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, let's all stand. Let's just be so intentional about our worship this morning as we worship the King, the beautiful one, the one who made us in his image, the one who has rescued us, the one who has ransomed us from death, the one who has come to take away the sins of the world, the one who was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Let's praise him. Let's usher in the, the presence of the Lord through our praises. He said he inhabits the praises of his people. Let's just give everything we got to Jesus this morning. Let's release a sound over Malibu this morning. The sound of praise shaking the heavens, shaking the earth, giving Jesus everything we got. Yeshua is the king. He is the most high. We press, we press with our 
our spirits, into your spirit. We allow your spirit to move in us. We break down every wall that separates us from your spirit in our lives right now. Yeshua, Ruach HaKodesh, fill us up, fill this place. Baptize us in your Ruach, baptize us in your Ruach. Right now, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up in the spirit right now. Yeshua, 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 name above all, name above all, name above all, Yeshua. Yeah, stir up your praise, stir up your praise, stir up your praise. Yeah, Yeshua, yeah, Yeshua, just stir it up, stir it up, stir up your praise. Stir it up, yeah, Yeshua. Yeah, Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeah, we bless you. Yeah, let's sing. I feel the nations of the earth are shaking.
bless your name, God. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to sing a Hebrew song. Because Kadosh.
praise you, God. We bless you, God. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you. Yeah, God, we bless you, we bless you, we bless your name. We declare that you are highly exalted. Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. We declare your name. We declare your name, Yeshua. We declare your name, Yeshua. We declare your name. You are the Kadosh one. Your name is holy and your name is one forever and ever, Yeshua. Kadosh Shemo, Ushemo Echad, Leolam, Vae. Yes, God. He's so holy, God. He's so holy, God. Yeah, just tell him. He's so holy. You're so holy, God. You're so holy, God. You're so holy, God. You're so holy, God. You're so holy. Just tell him. Just tell him. You're so holy, God. You're so holy, God. I praise you, Shah. You're so holy, God. You're so holy, God. You're so holy, God.
Yeah, let's be free, right? Who the sun sets free. Come on, shake it up. It's free. Come on. Come on, shake your life up for Jesus. Who the sun sets free is free. Why not be radical for Jesus, right? Who the sun sets free is free. Come on, sing it out. And who the sun sets free is free indeed. All over this place, you are free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed.
can compare to the Lion of Judah? Who can compare to the Lamb who was slain? Who can compare to Yeshua? Yeshua El Yakar, Sitamin, Virtuf Hadar, Pechad, Korim Lecha. Yeshua El Yakar, Yeshua precious Lord. Say Tamim, blameless lamb, the Atuf Hadar, arrayed in splendor. Oh, we worship Yeshua. God, just open our eyes to your kingship. Open our eyes to your rule and reign in our lives. Yeshua, purify your bride today. Open up our eyes. Open up our eyes. Come and take our lives, Yeshua, Yeshua. Yes, we just bless you, bless you, Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. We just worship, just worship. Just, just take a moment to look at the, the eyes of Yeshua, eyes that burn with flames. Take a minute to look at Yeshua's eyes. Look at the love. Look at his love for you. Look at his goodness. Yeshua. Thank you, Yeshua. I think Yeshua is Yeshua, El 
So, Abba, we just want to continue to worship you. I just feel that so many of us have been in the midst of a squeeze, that there has been pressure, and that there has been pressing going on in our lives. Even as I was just talking with one of our friends a moment ago, I just feel like the enemy is wanting to squeeze the life out of you. He's wanting to squeeze and press the hope out of you. He's wanting to squeeze and press the joy out of you. He's wanting to squeeze and press the faith out of you. And, and it seems like, man, everything has been squeezed out. It's like, God, what is left? And the Lord is saying he's allowing the squeeze so that we'll fall to our knees and that we will cry out to him and have a sense of desperation. The enemy's trying to squeeze, squeeze out the promise, but the Lord is trying to squeeze out the world. He's trying to cause us to want to press in and go to a new level, to seek him like we've never sought him before, to call out to him like we've never called out to him before. I don't, I don't know, I mean, he wants us to cry out, the Lord answer us on the day that we call. So I just wanted you to take a moment and whatever it is in your life, whatever the situations, whatever the circumstances, just ask him to come into them right now. In the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, just call on him now. Just call on him at your seat. Just invite him in. We say, Lord, come in. We invite you in. desperate for you. We're hungry for you. We're thirsty for you. We want to know you in the ways we've never known you before. There's so much more that you have for us past our limitations. When we can't to think we can't go any further, when we think that we're as broken as it can get, God says there is more. And so Abba, I just want to ask, I just want to ask that this week as we head into a week of 11-11 that 11 is the number of Joseph 11 is the number of supernatural breakthrough and of blessing and some of us feel like we're in the 11th hour and I'm just asking that it was at the Red Sea when it seemed as if they were going back to Egypt and they were going to die there in the desert it was in that place, God, that you parted the Red Sea, the 11th miracle that you brought them through, and you said to them, you will never go back to Egypt. So we just bless you now, and we say, God, from prison to the palace in this season, we're just believing, God, that was a, Lord, as, I, as we were praying for people even this morning, that's what kept coming forth. And so we just bless you now. We invite you, Yeshua, we invite you, Jesus. We thank you and we glorify you in Yeshua, Jesus' name. Amen. So just you guys can give me a little, little worship music there in the back. And I just want to, you can be seated. Give someone a hug real quick. Give someone a hug. Say hi. Dave's heart, and uh, and uh, we're just going to ask him to take a moment and share with us. So the last time we talked, two weeks ago, the Lord helped me express an idea about how life is at war with death in our realm, how the eternal is at war with time and the constraints that the press of time puts on us in our lives. The restrictions, the confines that we bump up against day in and day out. But God sent someone by the name of Jesus from the eternal and in love to show us that to live with him is to live in the eternal. 
in the middle of the circumstance. How do we access that? So real quickly, I'm going to read to you a scripture, a story about Elisha. Elisha went to a place called Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there and ate. She said to her husband, I know this man often comes our way. He is a holy man. He has the word of God. He carries with him the realm of the eternal. Let's make a small room for him on the roof and put there a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes. She was making room for the eternal, for the word of God, for the supernatural. One day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He was laying down in the place that she had made for him. He said to his servant, call this woman. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said, tell her, uh, you have gone to a great deal of trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak to the king on your behalf or the commander of an army? What can we do for you in this realm of the natural that's higher than you can reach? What can we do for you in this realm that governs your sphere? We want to talk to somebody. We want to give you an advantage you currently don't have in the realm that you can see. Hang on a sec. In the realm that you can see. So now I have to go without a Bible. And so she says, no, no, I'm comfortable because I live among my brethren. I'm here. I'm in a place of comfort. I'm well-to-do. I have what I need. I have friends. My circumstances are good. I really don't need anything. And then the servant pipes up and says, wait, wait, wait. Her husband is old, and she has no child. You see, in that day, a woman's significance many times came from her progeny, from the children she produced. Not only did she have no children, she had no son. It doesn't speak of another child. So we can look just from what we see that there was no heir, no place for the inheritance to go. What was the purpose of their existing if their name wouldn't be passed on? And so there she stands, her purpose unfulfilled in large measure. Her body was designed for it. Her DNA was meant for it. Inside of her was this purpose. And Elijah says, this time next year, you're going to hold a child. Whoa, no, 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 that's too big for me. That's the realm of the eternal. I didn't want what you could give for me in the realm of the natural. I really don't want you need what you can give me in the realm of the eternal. Don't get my hopes up. Don't take me there. My purpose is too big. My time has passed. It's gone. Don't do this to me. Sure enough, at the end of a year when Elijah came back around, she was holding a child. Her purpose had been birthed in the earth. She now had an inheritance. She now was no longer scorned among women. She didn't carry the shame. And now God had fulfilled in her what he had meant. And so let's bring it home real quick. One minute. And so it is by being here today, by investing yourself in this realm of the eternal where the word of God can gain entrance into your life. And he can begin to bring to you visions of what may be meant to be. You may be comfortable. You may be well-to-do. It doesn't matter. And there are people around you who can do what the natural could give you at its highest level. But it's not good enough. Because she was feeding a man a meal. She had made certain provision. She didn't know that she was sowing at a higher level into the ministry by making a room for this man. She gave more. But by giving more, she gained access to something more. By giving more, she didn't realize by her investing in God's word, God's word was going to come to her and do the impossible. 
reaching into the eternal and giving her an eternal inheritance, a lineage that would continue, and a story in the word of God that marks her as a woman of faith. And so it is with us. You've made provision for God. Is there something more you can do to access the purpose God has for you that's not yet born or that may be in its infancy? This was the realm that she lived in, and she gave more in the natural to reap more and reaped more in the realm of the eternal. They're not disconnected. Many times we look at them and oh, why in the world would you talk about resource? All the resource of the world itself, every blade of grass, every tree, every ounce of gold, every diamond came from the eternal realm. It came from the word of God and was cultivated and created in Jesus. So why would it not be governed by the eternal realm and the word of God? So it would make sense then that we would take our material and sow into the eternal in order to access, in order to make place for that eternal realm to honor us. What we honor, honors us. She honored God's word, she honored God's presence, and didn't it honor her? Didn't it give her what her purpose was? I know that in this place there are many who are pregnant, many who have not yet conceived of the purpose that God has placed you in the earth for. You're comfortable. Your life is good. But there's much more. So make a little more room in your life. Make a little more place in the provision for the word of God that you are hearing here and what you are investing. And then expect God to open the realm of the eternal to do the impossible through you and make you one of faith who marks the realm of the heavens and the earth. Amen. Ushers, if you could come forward with our offering envelopes, we have our offering envelopes that, uh, if you're a member here, we certainly recognize this is your opportunity to give. And if you're just visiting us here, um, you are welcome to give as well. But um, we also want to encourage you to take your tithes and your offerings to your home fellowship. If you don't have a home fellowship, we will certainly receive those tithes and offerings here on behalf of those who want to give. Wow. You know, there's so much that we do on every day that just seems like it's, um, there's not enough room for anything else. If we've got any children, the children can be released right now at this time. Lynn's back there. And, uh, got any other kids that need to go um, you can go back there with Lynn and uh, we actually have a children's service and uh, she takes care of kids good stuff okay has everybody got an envelope well ushers you can uh, come forward begin to receive our offerings that was a great word as I was saying, it seems like there's not really a whole lot more that we can fit into our lives. Um, we're so busy. We've got so much going on. Um, but when you hear a word like that, you realize that there is, in the midst of what we do on our daily basis, we may be making room for God to do more. For some of you, you think that it's just almost trite to pray it's almost trite to just throughout the week pray throughout the week give thanks throughout the week to take a moment to ask God to forgive you for sin for, to take a moment to press into God and offer him the sacrifice of not just thanksgiving, but to say to the Lord, Lord, the things that I'm doing as I go through work and play, I do unto you. And so for some of you, you might think, well, you know, that's just hardly seems like it's enough. I will confess. That word just I helps you to understand I will, I will. that in everything you do, 
everything in your work, in your prayer, in your play, everything you do, if you do it unto the Lord, God has an eternal reward waiting on you there. Awesome. Hey guys, I just want to take a minute, and this week is Wayne's birthday. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows that my, uh, my favorite number is 11. I'm all about the 11. I'm born on 111. This guy's born on 1111. So maybe that's why, part of the reason why I love him so much. The double ones right that's here, right? right? <laughs> so God, we just thank you for Wayne. God, we thank you for, for, his, for his life. That he just, he is such a blessing to each and every one of us. Just the passion and the joy and the enthusiasm and the wisdom and the, the understanding and the revelation, God, and just his commitment to, to covenantal relationships, to, 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 to walk with people for him and Lynn and, and the entire family, Lord. So we are just so grateful for them. We just love them so much. And I just want to lift him up to you. And just as 11 is the number of supernatural breakthrough, we are just believing in this season for Wayne and for Lynn for just supernatural breakthrough, God. We know there is more you have for them in this season. We're asking you to open the doors that no man can shut for them to part the seas, to bring them into the full inheritance of the fullness of the promise and use him in ways he can't even imagine to make an impact and a difference for the kingdom. I love him, Lord. My life is so much better because of him. And we're grateful that you brought him here to us in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Him and Lynn are such an incredible blessing to us as a community. Also just want to give... Um, we just want to say to Kathy, we love you. Kathy lost her horse of 30 years, who she was really close to, and uh, took such amazing care of. So we just love you, and we're just praying for you that God should just comfort you, and we just stand with you in the midst of your loss. And we know just how much a database was just a part of your life, and we love you, and we're grateful for you, and we're praying for you. and. We also want to be praying for the law, for Gerard and law, Gerard and Jeannie Long. Uh, this is the the day. This is the anniversary of of the day that they lost their son ten years ago, and so we just lift them up to you, Lord, and just pray your comfort over them, and your blessing over them to just be there with them and be with Kathy in the midst of the loss. Show yourself gracious and compassionate, and give them your comfort. Give them uh, your shalom. And God, I just thank you that uh, we believe there's horses in heaven. <laughs> and of course, our young ones. <laughs> and maybe he's coming back on database. So Lord, <laughs> so we love you, Lord, and thank you. And we just also want to mention, we've got a very special friend here today. Victor Chong is visiting with us all the way. His wife, Betty. And his wife, Betty. Good to have you guys with us over there. I didn't know where you were, all right. Visiting with us from... From, 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 from Latin America, it's so great to have you with us. And they're just doing incredible work. He, is, he works with Pastor Jonathan. And I mean, he is, a, he is Apostle of Paul, a modern day Apostle Paul, that God is just using him to plant thousands of churches and raise up leaders. And it's just gone to the places where no one wants to go. And so we just honor you and we bless you for the sacrifices that you've made for the kingdom. We've heard the stories how you're going all day and all night training pastors, doing evangelism, and then you get on the bus to go to the next city to do it all over again. So Lord, we just thank you for our brother right now. And we say over him and his family, Hazak, okay. Hazak, Vanita, Zake, they should be strong and be strong and be strengthened. And even as they have seen multiplication for the sake of the kingdom, we're asking for more God. We're asking for more lives to be touched. We're asking for greater transformation. God, we thank you that there is something that you are doing Lord, among those nations where you have placed him and there is a sense of need, there's such great need and such desperation and we thank you that you are the true answer and we ask that they would just see you work mightily, lives changed, kingdom expanded 
everything they need necessary. Raise up the workers, Lord. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We're asking for thousands and tens of thousands of workers for this church planting movement. Use them to be a catalyst. Use them to be an igniter in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So good to be back with you all. Of course, I missed you all last week while I was on a leadership cruise. I know that sounds really horrible in the Caribbean. Someone's got, to do, <laughs> Someone's got to do it. Well, you know, it's always a little interesting with 400 other rabbis and leaders. <laughs> there you go. And uh, it, was, it was a great time. I'm happy to report that I didn't kill my wife. Uh, yeah, I almost, I, I think I almost could have killed my wife. None of the rab- rabbis killed each other. None of the rabbis killed each other. No, I'll tell you the story is very funny, just real quick. So, like when I get on vacation, I get very adventurous. And so one day I took out jet skis and a bunch of us, we were jet skiing. I was going like 40 miles an hour, pushing it as fast as I could go, jumping the waves, a lot of fun. So I'm all adventurous. We get off the plane, we get off the boat the next day and we're in Nassau. And, uh, you know, my wife was like, hey, we were with a couple other friends. Really, She's like, hey, let's do a, a tour of the island. And the other guys were like, we don't really want to sit in a taxi and do a tour of the island. I said, well, let's see if we can rent something that we can ride ourselves around the island. And so there were these really cool, like, carts that you could rent, but they were kind of expensive. And so they said, well, we'll give you a really good uh, price on mopeds. (laughs) So we were like, yeah, let's get mopeds. And I saw the looks on my wife's face. Not into it. So they're like, you got to try out the mopeds before you do it. So I'm on the moped trying it out. And they made you go to like a tight space, like as, as not, no more broad than this, the, the alley here, but the space between our two chairs. When you get to the end, the hard part is turning around. I'm trying to turn it around, like back. It was a disaster. I come back down, and he's like, okay, ma'am, you get on. And you make sure you feel comfortable riding with him. She's like, he's better practice again before I'm getting on that thing. <laughs> Because I don't like his driving regularly, let alone on a moped in a foreign country where they drive on the opposite side of the road. So in the end, I didn't take the moped out. They gave me my money back, and I did not hurt my wife or kill her. So I think that's one of the wisest decisions I've made in a long time. So <laughs> got to know your limitations. So my wife was telling the story. She's like, honey, you're good at a lot of things, but mopeds, you know, not so much. Maybe that's why in my home there was three things you didn't do as a Jewish boy. There was no tattoos, no, no football, and no motorcycles. I probably would have killed myself or someone else on one. So there you go. But uh, it was great. We had a great time, and God was doing so much. It's so exciting to see what God is doing in the world, friends. We are living in exciting times. It's really incredible. I wish I had time just to share with you uh, all about that. But I want to begin by sharing with you something that happened with me to start by right before we left Uh, for vacation, Uh, the day before we left for vacation, uh, well, the the day before, uh, two days before, Avi got, Stephanie went out and got my boys pumpkins, and they were carving the pumpkins. And Avi is very creative, and he's very, like, you know, he's really, he's got, he's he's independent, and he, he wanted to draw something really cool. He couldn't just, like, Judah was happy with a little jack-o'-lantern face. Avi's like, no, we got to do something cool. We got to do something amazing. And so he decided that he was going to draw a tiger face on the pumpkin and carve it out. It was a very intricate car- tiger face. And I was like, you sure you want some help? Because, you know, if you carve it the wrong way, the whole thing just falls apart. So he's carving, and it's looking really cool. And then he makes an incision, and he, the whole thing just falls in. Then he gets upset and he like punches the pumpkin in the face and that's it. The pumpkin is completely demolished and we're like, Avi, come on, you know, it's just a pumpkin and it's not a big deal. And he's like, okay, I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't have punched it, but I just got so frustrated because I worked so hard to make the tiger face. And I'm like, but Avi, you know what? I'm proud of you because you know what? In life, things don't always work out, but sometimes you got to take risks. Sometimes you just got to take a risk. I mean, you weren't, I said, I'm proud that you were not happy with just doing a little simple thing. You wanted to do something creative. You took a risk. And you know what? Because you're willing to take a risk, we'll go buy you another pumpkin. 
Because I want you to learn the lesson that, there's not, that it's good to, to try things you've never tried before. And you know, that's, that's important in life to, to, have that, to have that value. You, you gotta have the faith to do things and sometimes they're gonna fail, but that's okay. You just get up and you do it again. Amen. That's it. You know, f- you know, how many of you guys know like failure is not fatal? <laughs> Failure is not fatal in life. Oftentimes, we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. And that's where the taking of the risk for God comes into play. You have to be willing to do that. If I gave up every time I failed, man, forget it. Who knows where I'd be? You know, I certainly wouldn't be here. And so, so we went the next day, and it's the evening, and I'm getting, I'm gonna, I'm, I got to get up, I got to, I got to get up early the next morning to head to the airport and do some stuff that night, and. So we said, okay, let's run and get you a pumpkin. So we run and get him a pumpkin, and I'm thinking, I'm going to take him to Trader Joe's because they've got the cheapest pumpkins, Trader <laughs> Joe's. And he's like, no, Daddy, there's a giant pumpkin patch on the other side of the high with the giant slide, you know, that they draw the kids in. they got to go where the slide is. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> unbelievable. Then they want to charge you $4 to go down the slide while you pay $50 for the pumpkin that's overcharged, the chutzpah that they have. So anyway, so, so we go there, and we pick, out a, we pick out a pumpkin for him. I was like, let's get another pumpkin for Judah, too. We'll get him a little smaller one. And, and we're standing there in line paying for the pumpkin, and I could tell this guy who was selling us the pumpkin wasn't really doing well. So I said, hey, my name's Jason. He says, my name's Robert. It's my dad's name. I said, are you okay? And all of a sudden, he starts breaking down in the tears. And he says, my wife has stage four cancer. And I just got off the phone with her. And he starts telling me his whole story about how she had battled it and how she had overcome it and he had stuck with her and how they told her at the hospital most spouses leave their, other, leave their spouse when they get that sick, but he's, he loves her and he can't imagine living without her and he's just so broken up about it and, and he's crying and I'm like, listen, I said, look, I, I'm a rabbi and a pastor and I said, you know, I've seen God do miracles. I've seen him heal cancer. God is awesome. He can do anything. I said, can we just pray with you? So he grabbed his hand and we just prayed with him and encouraged him and then, and then Avi said, I'm going to pray for you and and, um, and so, we, so we get in the car, and Avi goes, runs back to tell, just to tell him that we're going to be praying for him. And, and, uh, and he says to me in the car, Daddy, he goes, I think I get it. I was like, what do you get? He goes, tell me if I'm right. He said, I had to take a risk and ruin the pumpkin <laughs> so that I would need to go get another pumpkin and I didn't want to go to Trader Joe's. I didn't feel that's where we were supposed to go to get the pumpkin. And then God brought us to this place to get the pumpkin because that God knew that that man needed someone to pray for him. And God, he said, Dad, what a, like, God has, that was God's plan. God has a plan. And he used us as part of his plan to pray for that man because he needed someone to pray for him and encourage him. He's probably working out there in the pumpkin patch because he has to pay for the doctors for his wife. And we were able to go there and pray for him and buy a pumpkin to help him. (laughs) He said, we ought to tell other people to go there and buy a pumpkin and pray for the guy. You know, and I was like, sometimes you just say, all right, Lord, I did something right. (laughs) Something right. At least one thing I did right. (laughs) Raising my child. (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) But friends, I want to encourage you that just like with the pumpkins, sometimes our pumpkins get smashed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the things that we're working on just seem to cave in, seems to have gone to ruin. God has a plan even when it comes to pumpkins. Even the pumpkins are part of his plan. He even has a purpose with the ruined pumpkins. How much more does he have a plan for our lives? Amen. How much more does he use our situations and our circumstances to touch people and position us to be in a place to be there for people and to understand that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. You know, we talked about last week, Psalm 115, verse 16, well, two weeks ago. It says, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, 
but the earth he has given to the sons of men, to mankind. And the reality is we share that God doesn't need our help to make heavens heavenly because heaven is filled with the presence of God. It's filled with his majesty. It's filled with his glory. It's filled with the angels. It's filled with the worship. It's filled with the saints around the throne. And it's a place of glory and perfection, serving him night and day continually. So he doesn't need our help in making heaven holy. But to make this world like heaven is one of the primary tasks that he has entrusted to us who are called to reflect his image and likeliness. That man and that pumpkin patch experience the care and the concern of heaven. In that moment, there was a little bit of heaven in the midst of the hell that he was going through. A little bit of heaven in the midst of the the hell that he was going through to make this world something more than what it is. That's one of our primary tasks and our responsibility to help transform earth into heaven. Because you are carriers of heaven. You are made in his image and likeliness You carry heaven within you because not only is that the mold in which you were made, but just like a mold needs to be filled, God filled you with his presence. He filled you with his spirit. The day that you called upon Jesus as your Messiah, he put his spirit, his ruach in you. He sealed you with it. He filled you with it. The spirit that raised Messiah from the dead, the spirit that hovered over the face of the deep in the very beginning and brought order out of chaos, that spirit lives in you. It is the spirit of heaven that resides in you. And wherever you go, you carry heaven with you. You carry the hope of heaven every place that you enter. And you have the potential, not only the potential, you have been created for the purpose. You have given the responsibility. You have been endowed with the authority to bring heaven to everywhere where the Jew go so that people can experience the goodness, the grace, the glory of our Messiah, of our Lord, Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Friends, amen. That's an awesome task. That you walk in such a way that everywhere you become, everywhere that you go, every place that you establish yourself, your home, your office, that it becomes your life, it becomes a picture of heaven. That when people see you, they see something more than you. And it's the idea behind what the Lord taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, what? On earth as it is in heaven. That wasn't just some kind of like wishy-washy prayer, like, man, let's just pray this and maybe one day this. This is an apostolic prayer that the Messiah gave to us to pray that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You are carriers of the kingdom. Right? The gospel says the kingdom of God is where? Within you. You are carriers of the king because the king has taken up residency within you and you carry the culture of the kingdom. And we're called to partner with him to make heaven a reality here on earth. That's what it means to bring the kingdom, to give people a glimpse, to give people a taste of heaven while they're here on earth. That's an awesome responsibility. Friends, that is something worth getting up every day and living for. To know that this day, through my dancing, through my acting, through my business, through my going to the grocery store, through my getting gas, through everywhere, through being with my families, through being with my kids, that everywhere that I go, people are going to encounter God in me. And and that the one who is in me is greater than the one who is in the world. That no matter what's going on outside in the midst of the craziness and the chaos, that we have someone who is greater and that has overcome the world. 
And this is what an aspect of what it means, as we said a few weeks ago, to made B'Tselem Elohim in the image and likeliness of God. In the image and likeliness of the Lord. And the Lord wants to establish his image and likeliness in us, but he also wants to establish it through us. He's establishing his image in you so that he can establish his image in the world through you. Amen. And part of what limits that image is our lack of imagination. Image and imagination go hand in hand. Because if you can't imagine it, if you can't dream it, you will never see it become a reality. You will never see it come to pass. That's why Joseph has to be a dreamer. That's why Daniel has to be a dreamer. That's why Abraham has to be put to sleep and have a dream. That's why Peter has to have dreams. That's why Jacob has to have a dream in which he sees a ladder coming from heaven to earth. So many, so if you, you have to have these, God wants us to be dreamers because he wants to increase and expand our imagination because sometimes what we think impossible is just too small. And what we think God can do to change life, sometimes we give up on people and situations. God's saying, no, imagine with me. Dream with me of what I can do through you to this day. This means that we're, we're created to, to be, we're, he created us and that we have a responsibility from the least of us to the greatest to be in partnership with the Lord. That's why God gives Adam dominion and authority over the earth, over the animal kingdom. The earth is ours to perfect to bring into the fullness of its purposes and destiny, to worship and to reflect the goodness and the glory of the creator in whose image we are made. And we mentioned last time that we're kind of like, like our lives are meant to be like a stamp. And the question is, what type of stamp are we leaving on the world around us? What type of mark are we leaving on the lives around us? Is our, is, our, is, our, is our mark like the artist brush that makes everyone that we come in touch with beautiful so that even when they come to us and we see the mistakes in their lives, it's like Avi drew this picture and he was so upset he wanted to make a dragon and he knew he messed it up. And I said, Avi, when I was young, my art teacher told me there's no, su- there's no such thing as a mistake in art. What? Look at that mistake. What do you see it having the potential to become? And he drew it into a beautiful whale. You know, are we people that when we look at the mistakes and we look at the, the flaws in other people, do we, see, do we see, man, there's something beautiful that can be made out of this? Or do we see those, those marks and we say, hey, that's kind of like graffiti, so I'm going to help you. I'm just going to tag it up a little bit more. We're called to carry his presence into the world. We are created to be God's reflection We're called to be image bearers. And we do this by having his presence of his spirit in our life. The simple meaning of the words in the beginning indicates that creation is only the first step in the ongoing, in an ongoing process. God didn't finish creation after the first seven days. Creation is an ongoing process that God renews daily the work of creation. It was the beginning of a process that we were intended to partner with him and partners in creation, helping God realize his desire to create a dwelling place here below like he has a dwelling place above. God created the material world but left it to us, left to us the task of revealing the spiritual within it. God looked into the the Torah. He looked into the world and created the world. And man looks into the Torah and maintains it. So this idea that God had the, we talked about this before, and the, that the scriptures were the blueprint for creation, that before the world was, Proverbs 8 says, God created wisdom. Wisdom comes from the word. So God created the world and, maintained, and through the word, but through his word, we maintain it. 
The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. This is pretty incredible, right? Psalm 115, 16. To be a good leader means to delegate. If you can't learn to delegate, you will never lead anything of any size and of significance, and you will burn out. And that was what this whole cruise was on, was on burnout. Because they figure, you know, if, you know, ministry people deal with burnout. <laughs> and to be a good leader, you have to learn to delegate. Why? Because you can't do it all. Because God created us to be a team. And the truth is, team always trumps talent. Team always trumps talent. Doesn't matter how talented and gifted an individual is, Michael Jordan, even Michael Jordan, couldn't single-handedly win the NBA championships for his team. And the truth of the matter is that one of the early, one of the early end, in the early days of, guys remember the dream team, the first NBA all-star Olympic basketball team comprised of? The first game, he, the, the coach took them and had them play against a, a all-star college team, and guess what? The dream team lost. Why? Because the college kids played team. And the all-stars were all about talent and ego. And team always trumps talent. You can't do it alone. And all leadership books and principles found in them are a footnote to the scriptures. The Lord delights in delegating. He is the first delegator. We learn delegation from him. When he gives man and woman in the very beginning dominion and authority over creation, God delegates to us the responsibility of helping to partner with him to create heaven on earth. By delegating responsibility and authority over creation to those made in his image, he confers dignity, identity, and purpose. You have delegated authority by God to do something in this world. That's pretty awesome. The commander-in-chief of the universe delegates to you responsibility and partnership. And God's original plan was to rule over the earth and to steward the earth with us. God created the world and he called it what? When is, oh, he called it very what? Very good, tov me od, but he doesn't call it perfect. Why? The world was made good, but it wasn't made complete. Because he called us to help him to complete it. Creation was not me meant to come to its completion apart from us, apart from us taking our place of responsibility and authority in the created order by the means of our relationship with him. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. But there's a challenge here. There's a challenge for us here. Challenge why it's hard for us to do. In the beginning, God created... In the, in the, in the, in the, uh, Thus the heavens and the earth were created in all their array. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he abstained from all the work which he created to do. These are the products of the heaven and the earth when they were created on that day, verse 4, that God made earth and heaven. Now all the trees of the field were not yet on the earth, and all the herb of the field had not yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent the rain upon the earth, and there was no man to work the soil. And a mist ascended from the earth and watered the whole surface of the soil. And the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the soul of life, and he became a life, he became a living being. So God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Some of the rabbis say that he took dirt from the four corners of the earth and brought it uh, together to form us. Some say that the main dirt came from Mount Moriah, the place the altar would be established, a place where Abraham offered Isaac. So there would be part of that holy ground 
in our composition, in our, in our DNA. And then he breathes, then he takes this lump of mud in the dirt and he forms man out of the, out of, out of the mud of the earth and he breathes the breath of life in him. Why? Just like God created heaven and earth, he creates us part earth, literally from the dirt, and part heaven with the divine breath. There's only two things that have the breath of God in it. That's the script, all scripture is God breathed. That's why the word of God is internal. It's his divine breath that comes through his word. That's why we need to study the word because it breathes new breath, new life into us. And then he, the soul of man. And just like Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, right? Before my words pass away. So the word will never pass away. It's eternal. Our soul will never pass away because it comes from the divine. There's, there's, an, there, there's an eternal nature to our soul. And then, and then he, it's kind of like he, he forms us, he creates us. And it's so interesting because the New Testament equivalent to this miracle was the man born blind. Right? He takes the mud of the earth, he spits in it, and he puts it on his eyes to confer divine DNA and transformation into the man. But God formed us, verse 7. He formed us part of heaven, a physical part, part a spiritual part that came directly from his, him, directly from his mouth. Verse 7, it says, he, and he formed man. And here is the interesting thing about the word form there. In the Hebrew, it's written in a very unusual way. The word is yatsar. Can you say yatsar? Or yotzer. And literally in this verse is vayitzer. And it's written, it's written with yotzer begins with the letter yud. Can you say yud? It's the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the first letter of the divine name. yud he vav he or, or Yahweh, as many pronounce it. It's the first letter of the name of Jesus, Yeshua. And it's interesting because the rabbis say he created this world with the letter He and the life of the world to come. He created with the letter Yid. That's a whole other discussion. We won't go there. But this word is written unusual because it has two Ys. It has Yud Yud, which is very unusual. It's, I don't think it's written anywhere like that elsewhere in the entirety of Scripture. So the question is, why is it written in this very unusual way with this two Yuds? What, is it, what does it tell us? First thing it tells us is that we were created in how many parts? Two parts. We just said it. What were those two parts? Earth and the breath. So heaven and earth. So even in our creation, the word for God forming us is an allusion to these two aspects of our being. But there's something more. He not only created us in two parts, he created us with two impulses. One is called the Yetzer Ha-Ra. Can you say the Yetzer Ha-Ra? And one is the Yetzer Ha-Tov. Can you say Yetzer Ha-Tov? The Yetzer Ha-Tov is the good inclination. It's our desire for God. It's our desire for spirituality. It's a desire to show kindness and compassion and forgiveness to others. You know, it's a desire to see his kingdom come. But then there's another, it's the spiritual part, it's the spiritual impulse of humanity, but then there is this another impulse known as this Yetzer Hara, Yetzer Hara, say that with me? Which is known as the bad inclination, or some translated evil inclination, but it's not evil in the way that we think of evil, it's the physical inclination. Right, so God made us with these two inclinations, a physical impulses and desires, because oftentimes, I just, this is important, because oftentimes we think of our impulses and desires as something that is a result of the fall. It's not. The desire for physicality is not something that is a result of the fall. The desire for food, the desire for sex, the desire for pleasure, these are, this is an impulse that God created us with, but we, we need to learn to subdue our impulses and desires and use them in the service of God so that we can truly reflect his image and likeness given the power and authority that he has placed within us. So when God says you'll rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, it implies both dominion and descent. What does that mean? When man walks worthy of God's image according to the Lord's will, he has dominion over them. And all of creation is in order and everything functions the way it's supposed to. 
But when we walk in an unworthy manner like animals, then guess what happens? The animals take dominion and authority over us. When we lower ourselves because our, imp- our, our physical impulses overcome and overshadow our, our spiritual impulse and our spiritual drive and our spiritual need, then we, then God makes us. It says, I've made you, it says, I've made you a little lower, oftentimes the angel says, than the angels, but it actually says he made us a little lower than God. But when we act like animals, we're not, we're not, we're lower than God, we're lower than the angels, we're lower than the animals. We lower ourselves. We could talk about this in Egypt. That was one of the ten plagues on Egypt. The animals took dominion over them. Instead of them having restraint and them having dominion over the animals. But the Yetzer Tov, the, the, the Yetzer Hara, the physical material desire, represents the earthly part of us. That is part of who God created us to be. These desires aren't, they're not bad. They're either good or bad depending what it is that we do with them. Are we mastering them or are they mastering us? Because I'm concerned that sometimes I see among, uh, among believers that there's this kind of dualism that everything spiritual is good and everything physical is bad. So like making money is bad because you should just be doing the kingdom and you should spend all day in your closet praying and like being involved in... In, 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 in generating wealth and, and being involved in Hollywood. Who could be involved in Hollywood and music and the arts? It's corrupt. How could you be with those people? Listen, that's good. God created us to be creators. He created us to be generators of resources. And, some, and I think there's this, and, I, and oftentimes when we look at sex, we think it's dirty and it's evil and we have all these body images where we're not comfortable with ourselves and all these sorts of things, and, and we feel guilty about, about you know, there's, there's people starving and hurting in the world, and I'm in Malibu on Sunday morning, and I feel guilty about, like, taking care of myself, and I'll be honest, sometimes I just, I, I, I haven't taken care of myself, and, and I'm trying to learn how to have boundaries and to be healthy and not to run myself to death because I'm so focused on the spiritual. I understand what that looks like. Always trying, you know, and there was this, it was this famous rabbi, his name was Hillel, he lived before Jesus, and, he, and much of Jesus' teachings are in line with some of the things Hillel said, and kind of formed some of the background. And Hillel one day was going to the bathhouse to enjoy the bathhouse, and someone said to him, shouldn't you be helping people, shouldn't you be studying, shouldn't you be praying, why are you wasting time in going to, going to, 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 to leisure, and to sit in the bathhouse? And, you know, if you've ever been to Israel, the bathhouses are amazing. Like, when I, I don't mean today. I mean, when you go to the ancient bathhouses in the first century, they had heated floors. The Romans knew how to heat the floors. I mean, their technology was crazy for the first century. It's unbelievable. I like the bathhouse. Anyway, that's besides the point. And I got my boy, I got some other you guys who went with Israel, Bill and Teresa. Weren't you amazed by the, the, the technology? It's crazy. Anyway, come with us to Israel. You'll see the bathhouses for yourself and much more. But he goes to the, he says, listen, he goes, if a king has a statue, do you think he lets the statue get moldy and dirty? No. If there's a statue of the king, they make sure the statue is well maintained because the, Im- because the statue is the image of the king and the disrespect, the image is to disrespect the king. And we're made in his image, physically and spiritually. We have to learn to take care of ourselves. We have to learn to take care of creation. We have to be concerned with the environment. We have to be concerned not not just for our spirit, not just for other people's spirit, but also for our bodies. And when our soul and spirit become secondary, so, you know, one of the things is that it's believed that we're in Jewish thought that we're held accountable for every good thing God gave us, but but we chose not to enjoy. Every good thing that he gave us, but we chose not to enjoy. He's given us so much goodness, and we're called to enjoy it. Enjoy the blessings. I mean, how many, I mean, you can come to Malibu, I can come to Malibu every day and work and miss the beauty of the ocean. 
I could come to Malibu every day to work and never go to the beach. That's missing it. It's missing it. Do we enjoy the blessings he's given us? But there's also a danger when our soul and spirit become secondary and subservient to our spiritual wants and desires. The Yetzir Hara is meant to be subservient to the Yetzir Hatov. Seek first his kingdom and then all these things will be added to us. What, what is, so the question is, what are your thoughts? What are your words? What do your speech say? Are your desires more like God and Messiah Jesus or it's more like the animals? What are the things that you think about? What are the things that you desire? What are the We're nothing more than animals. Do we speak and think about the king, godly purposes? It's not that it's wrong to desire these things. Sex, the body, these are beautiful and holy. Sex is beautiful and holy for one reason, right? Eating is good, but gluttony is bad. Sex is beautiful because it's meant to bring intimate connection. That's why pornography is so bad, right? So meaningless because it's just an empty, like, fornication or pornography because it's just an empty physical act. It's pure pleasure with no concern, care, or commitment for the other person. It's the, the person just becomes a thing. It's the reason why in Scripture, you know what the most unclean thing is in Scripture? It's a dead body. That is the most unclean thing. Why? Because the body was created for the soul. When the soul has vacated the body, Elvis has left the building. <laughs> There's no point to it anymore. The body exists for the sake of the soul. When the soul and the spirit empty and there's nothing there, it has no intrinsic value. So what makes the body holy and valuable is what's inside it. Once the spirit and soul are God, it's an empty shell. It's kind of at the funeral. The body can look good. They can be, man, you never looked that good a day in your life. <laughs> but it's just an external appearance. There's no reality to it. There's no life in it. And that's kind of like the difference between spirituality and religion in the negative sense. You can do all of these religious things. You can go through all of these actions and you can get up every day and, and say a prayer by rote and you can get up every day and read the Bible and check your box off and, and you can get up, go to church and you can even give money. And you know what? It can be like that dead body. If there's no heart or spirit or connection or intimacy that is behind it. You will love the Lord your God with what? Heart. The word there for love, levavecha, can you say? Levavecha. It's spelled unusually as well. It's spelled with two V's, two baits, which is vav. Why? Because it's said that we're to serve, the bait is the number two. We're called to serve God with both parts of us, our physical and our spiritual. It's not either or, it's both working together. Now the Lord God planted, verse 8, chapter 2, verse 8 of Genesis. Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there was a man he put there that he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden there was a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four waterheads. And the name of the first is Pishon, and the winds through the land of Hav and winds through the land of Havila, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin, onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs through the east side of Asher, uh, Ashur, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. 
So we'll save this and we'll save the rest for next time. Friends, the first thing the Lord did in the very beginning, we talked about this the first week we started the series, what did God do before the beginning? He had to create what? Space and time. So for anything other than Richard, I'm proud of you, man. Good job, many of you. So God, God was all that was. God literally had to create space and time for anything else to exist. He was all that was. Part of what it means to be made in God's image is to be image bearers. Image is about imagination, but image is also about imitation. Part of what it means to be made in God's image and to be image bearers is that we imitate God in all things. Just follow me as I follow Messiah. Imitate me as I imitate Messiah. Imitation is the highest form of flattery. I had a guy on the ship saying, hey man, you like my hat? I got it from you. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> and out of love, the Lord created for us a place called what? The Garden of? The place he called paradise, right? Which Eden means paradise, delight. And, there, and, 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 we were, and we were, and still, we were created and were called, guess what? To imitate God and do the same. God created space and he created time, and guess what we're called to do? Create a space for him to dwell. Amen. That's part of, just like God created a space, we're to create a space for God in our lives. We're to create a space for God in the world. And it's interesting, because some of you might be wondering, man, why does God go into all this detail about there's gold, there's resin, there's onyx, he goes into all this detail. Why? Because these are a foreshadowing of the tabernacle that was to come. Basically, what he's doing is man in the garden was created, as we said before, it says to worship and obey. Man is created, as, we're created as a priesthood. We're put in the garden with gold, and it's like the garden is like the tabernacle. Okay? And so God is trying to, everything that was there is going to go to make up the tabernacle is priestly language that is used. God calls us to create a space where it says in, in Exodus, it says, Vishachanti mikdash asuli betocham. Let them build me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. What God's saying is, is you lost Eden, but guess what? I'm going to come back and dwell in your midst. Make me a space to dwell. Make me a space and I will come dwell in your midst. Or it can be translated literally in you. That's why when you look at the construction of the tabernacle, it is a portable Garden of Eden. You literally have the cherubim on the curtains, like the cherubim that guarded the way back in. You have the gold, you have the onyx, you have the resin. The priesthood is restoring. God was walking in the garden with Adam. Now God is walking again with us in the midst of the people and everything that made someone impure and not able to enter into the tabernacle, if you touched a dead body or there was a deformed, a deformed priest, why? Anything that was a reminder or had the residue of the fall was not able to enter into the new picture of Eden, of paradise. And who does God call to be the primary person to build this Mishkan? What's his name? Does anyone remember? Bezalel, Be Be uh, in English, Bezalel, how do you say it in English? Bezalel, Bezalel in Hebrew. God says, see, I have called you by name, Bezalel, son of Or, son of Hur, from the tribe of Judah, and I will fill him with the spirit of, of God, the spirit of Elohim, with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Guess how old Bezalel was when God called him, according to Jewish tradition, he was 13 years old. Could you imagine 13 years old and you're called to build the dwelling place, house of God with all these intricate vessels, holy vessels, and God's going to come and dwell in the midst of the ark and the cherubim and all of this, right? Why this man? Listen, names are about, names are more than name. You know what, you know what Bezalel means? Beit Salel, it means? Beit means in Cell means shadow, and El means God. It means one who dwells in the shadow of God. 
One who dwells in the shadow of God and he fills him, right? He fills him with the spirit of God, like the spirit of God hovering over the deep with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. God created the world. We talked about this too. He created the world with what? Wisdom. That same spirit over creation dwells in this one who was chosen to live in his shadow. And he reflected that. Bezalel sought God. He lived in his presence. He lived in his shadow. We'll, we'll stop in a minute, but this ties back to what we said two weeks ago. To be made in God's image and likeliness is to be made. Does anyone remember the Hebrew term? Be-what? Selem. Can you say but Selem? Elohim. Do you see the connection? Beit Salel, Beit Selem. They're connected. The word for in his image can literally mean Beit Selo, in the shadow of God we were created. We were created, as we talked about, to be God's shadow. The shadow is the reflection of the body. There's no shadow apart from my body, only in movies, right? My shadow is here because I'm here and the light's shining on me. So the point is this, made in his image means that we're called to be the shadow of God. And when we dwell in his shadow, we're able to fulfill, just like Bezalel, because he lived in his shadow, built the tabernacle, just like we're made in his image, God has called us and created us to partner with him to create something in his world that reflects his glory that brings transformation, that brings change to everyone who encounters him. And why does God create man in this, on the sixth day? Why does he create us on the last day? So we should find all things ready for us, like the groom prepares a home for the bride before he goes out to marry her, to communicate that all things were created for your blessing and benefit. God Guys, isn't that awesome? Everything God created was for your blessing and benefit. He created everything and just put you in the midst of it. He created the beauty of the world and he just plopped you down. He's like, there you go, son. There you go, daughter. This is all yours. What all is mine? It's all yours. Enjoy it. Take delight in it. Steward it. Expand it. Grow it. Use it. And the beauty of creation was created for you. And it's meant to give us a sense of value and sense of worth and a sense of self-esteem. If you are the crown of creation, that's your identity. You've got to know that. You're a child of the king. There was, you know, there was, you know, there was, a, there was a rabbi who had spent hours and hours shaking people's hands from morning to night. And people would say, don't you get tired of hearing problems over and over and giving blessings over and over again? Doesn't exhaust you. He goes, listen, Does a diamond dealer ever get tired of counting his diamonds? Right? You don't get tired of counting your diamonds. You don't get tired of counting the things that you love the most. That's how God feels about you. You're like his diamond. And in other words, the Lord saves the best for last. But there's something, and we're the best for last. You might be like, I don't know about, I know some people, they don't seem the best for last. I don't know about that. They're a little more like the diamond while they're still in the coal. But you are a diamond, friends, and you got to know that. But there's something else, and we'll close with this. If we don't walk worthy of the image we were created in, the Lord says, even the gnats and the flies preceded your existence. Being created last was meant to instill a sense of honor and self-esteem, but it was also created to create a sense of humility in us. Our later appearance reminds us that we are all created by and have all come from the Lord. We didn't create one thing on our own. So being last is a being also a warning to humble you. Remember where you came from. Remember when you came forth. Remember that there was something before you in the beginning. But remember the potential that you have the power and the place to rise to. So we thank you, God. (coughs) We're dust and ashes, but at the same time, we have the divine breath and the whole world was created for us. We thank you, God, that Messiah came 
to give his life for us. And even if, we're the, even if there was only one left, he still would have come because one soul, one soul is of infinite value and worth to you. That's how much you love us. You leave the 99 to go after the one because no one is, no one is less important than another one. They, every single one is a diamond. Every single one has value. Every single one of you has purpose. Every single one of you has potential. Every single one of you is a diamond. A diamond reflects light. It reflects glory. It, 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 it is something of beauty and a beautiful diamond is breathtaking and God has made made you to be breathtaking and he has made you to reflect his goodness and his glory and to refract the light and the shine for him and to when people look at your life and they see the shadow they see the image they're meant to stand in awe they're meant to stand in wonder they're meant to say wow that you were once blind but now you see you were once you were once you were once a wretch you were once you were once broken goods but look what God has done in your life to change you and to transform you the power of God God, the presence of God, the goodness of God, of what he wants to do with you. And so we thank you, Lord, for the way that you've created us and help us to get hold of the desires and the inclinations and the tendencies and the things that we struggle with. Help us, Lord, to understand that the broken pumpkins have a purpose. The things that are broken in our lives have a purpose, that there is a plan, even in the midst of the problems and the pains, God, that you have something much greater to do through us and are preparing us for it. So I ask today that as we close in this worship God that whatever it is that we've been whatever it is that we have in our lives God that you would come and meet us that you would come and change us and we say come Holy Spirit come Lord come Lord and touch us and do something in our lives right now and friends I want to encourage you if you've never asked Jesus into your heart if you've never asked the spirit to come and fill you if you don't know his redemptive power, just say, Lord, I need you. I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your forgiveness. I need what you did for me when you died and rose again. Just ask him to come and fill the spaces that are empty in your life and watch what he will do in you and through you. What you become, you won't even begin to know. And just ask him today, no matter what, to just fill you for his glory. In his son's name, amen.
God, but we want more of you. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. Just fill us. It's no longer I who live, but Messiah who lives in me. So we thank you. Do that work of transformation and of new creation. We believe the gospel is true. It is the power of God into salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So we bless you now. Gospel, go forth, is going forth. We ask God the gospel would come forth with power and with a demonstration of your glory and of your goodness. So we bless you now in Yeshua Jesus' name. Friends, it's great to see all of you here today. Just real quick, there's going to be some people praying. If you need prayer, our ministry team will pray for you. The other thing is, I want to encourage you guys, it's really important. I want to invite you next week to invite some friends. Because next week we have a guest speaker. Um, Mark, can you flip off the stream for me? It's off? Okay. So, so next week, I can't say this on the live.